Hello, um, I'm Tamsin Bellaby. Thank you so much for joining me. This is my first time presenting at an educational event. Um, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm really grateful for you joining me. Thank you. I am a, an art teacher and I have been for three years. I teach year seven right up to A level. Uh, and I'm a career change teacher. I had a career in the design industry before I became a teacher. I'm also an A-level examiner for OCR and I'm a pastoral leader as well. So today I'm going to talk to you about my, uh, my question, which is, which comes first, creativity or knowledge? So I advocate that to be creative, you have to have a wealth of embedded knowledge. Creativity is a result of knowledge. Um, and put simply, being creative is about breaking rules. It's about knowing the rules that exist within, uh, within a subject area. So for my experience, it's art. Um, and, and knowing how to operate successfully within those rules but then taking that deep knowledge and understanding how you can then break those rules cleverly uh, to be creative. So, as I said, I advocate that knowledge has to come first for our students then to be successfully creative. So I could give you an analogy that um, if we asked a student to, to express themselves through an English essay, for example, um, they would need for them to creatively express themselves in writing. They would need to have a knowledge of um, vocabulary, both technical and tier two. They'd need to understand sentence structure, handwriting. They'd need to know the, the have quite a wealth of knowledge of the subject and also the concepts that they're expected to explore in that in that essay. They'd need to know punctuation and spag. You know, the, the list is endless. Um, and I think we can all agree that those students couldn't possibly creatively express themselves without having all of that knowledge. I believe that it's very similar when you are teaching art. You have to teach them the basics, the core knowledge, that really, really deep understanding. And they have to have that knowledge embedded before they can then break those rules to then express creativity. So I'm going to talk to you today, um, not from a position of me being an expert, but I'm going to talk to you about what I've done and what my department has done and what we have found has been successful um, and certainly some things that haven't been successful. So we'll explore those too. Um, and some of the things that I keep coming coming up against or sort of, you know, um, experiencing a sort of barriers and myths that people believe about art. Um, so the first one that I sort of experience is that art is this creative sort of ethereal um, floaty subject that, that, that actually it's really difficult to nail down why something's successful. So I believe that that's a myth um, and actually that, that's something that, that I would like to debunk. Um, the second barrier or myth that I come across is that some people are, you know, believed to be naturally gifted um, and others just can't. You know, art's just not that not their thing. Um, now, whilst I, I, I will absolutely agree that, that different students have different starting points, I do not believe that anybody is naturally gifted um, in a creative subject. Often, almost always, if you unpick a student that is seen as being really, really gifted, you will see hours and hours and hours and hours of very deliberate practice, usually because they're heavily interested in what it is that they're being successful in. Um, so it's not an accident. It's not luck. Um, they're not naturally gifted at all. They're highly practiced. Um, the third uh, the fir third mis uh, sort of myth that I come across is that art is seen as this uh, feminine subject for girls. Um, and actually, the evidence says that, that it is very much seen like that, that 30, I mean, like our, our last cohort of uh, in our exam this year, only 33% of those entrants were boys. Um, 
and uh, they talk about it quite heavily Pinkett's, uh, Pinkett and Roberts in Boys Don't Try and, and sort of you know why is this and I think boys are really po prone to peer pressure so with the uh, the introduction of the EBAC and the sort of raising of status in, e in the EBAC subjects what we're seeing is that students have limited choice on their options and the subjects that they can then take and I wonder then if that peer pressure from the boys they then experience that at a sort of increased rate um, and then we're getting even less boys um, it has always been a historical problem but it does actually believe it or not seem to be getting worse we seem to be having fewer and fewer boys um, and the last myth that I come across, and this is sort of my core focus for today, is the fact that some people believe that creativity is stifled uh, by teaching knowledge explicitly in art and also by teaching through direct instruction. So these are the things that these four uh, areas are things that, that I don't believe. I don't believe that they're true. But what I do believe is that art is an academic discipline. I believe that everyone can get better at art and I also believe that everyone can access this subject um, and I believe that with knowledge creativity will blossom but I don't believe creativity will blossom without that foundation of knowledge. So I have to sort of give a disclaimer before I go any further. One of the things that I find is um, key to the success within my classroom and within the art department that I work for is the super high expectations of behavior. Now my disclaimer is that I work in such an amazing academy that have this hit this amazing focus, this driven focus on providing the culture and the climate for the students to thrive in. So behaviour is a really, really, it's it's one of our top priorities. And I uh, work with an SLT uh, team who who see it as their responsibility. Behaviour is the SLT's responsibility. And therefore, as a classroom teacher, I just teach. I am just focused on teaching. I have no split attention worrying about people talking or, you know, misbehaving. I am there to teach. So that's my disclaimer. Um, it doesn't mean that if you don't, if you work in an academy that doesn't have that, that support, it doesn't mean that you can't achieve the climate that I'm going to describe. I just recognize that it might be a little bit more challenging without the support of the rest of the academy behind you. So the first thing, um, if you were to enter my art classroom, you would notice is that my desks are in rows. Um, and this is because I want to be able to see every one of my students' faces. I want them to be able to see me at all times. And I also want them to be able to see the board. Um, and as I go through my presentation a little bit later, you'll be able to see how important the board and the visualizer is to uh, my practice. So the second thing that I insist upon is silence as standard. And I know that there are some, um, some, some difference in opinion in education. I I'm completely unapolog unapologetic that I expect silence in my classroom and it's and it's a standard it's the it's the expected state that we learn in and um, you are you are it's not social time you know you're there to learn so silence is standard and the reason is that allows really high quality direct instruction from me um, and modeling and also I get the students full attention and they get my full attention as well, which is super important. So no split attention from staff or, or students. The third thing that I really, really focus my attention on, particularly in September, but also revisiting after long holidays, are my routines. So it's I, I literally practice makes perfect. And I invest a huge amount of time with my students, again, particularly in September, to drill you know, really efficient routines for getting into the classroom, getting tidied up, handy books out, you know, as a practical, uh, a practical subject, you can imagine we have huge amounts of equipment out of the desk at any one time. And, you know, a, a frustration that I'm sure all art teachers will share with me or many will, is that for key stage three, I only see my students for 60 minutes a week. So every second of that hour is precious. So I invest time in routines that are efficient and save time. And I know that feels really counterintuitive, doesn't it? I invest time in making people do things quickly so that I gain time back, but it does, it does reap the benefits. It is worth doing. 
Uh, and the fourth thing that I do uh, to establish this climate of, of learning within my classroom is we have this culture of respect. And again, it, it is academy wide. So I am very lucky that it's not just me battling alone in my own little cocoon of my classroom. Um, it is a culture for respect. And in our academy, um, we're all, you know, we're, it's something that we all say quite regularly, actually, is that your teacher's words are gold dust. And I, I think it was Barry Smith that said it first at Great Yarmouth. But, you know, it really is true. Students should be hanging on your every word. You are the expert in the room. You have a wealth of, of education and experience in your subject. Students are expected to be sort of respectful and listening to you at all times. Um, so I've just sort of outlined how important sort of behaviour and attitude and culture and climate are in my classroom. And I'm aware that I'm lucky enough that it's sort of academy wide as well. Um, but I believe that you could still establish this in a classroom if you don't have the support of the wider academy. So I'm going to speak to you now about my, my teaching philosophy. Um, and I'm going to start by just sharing the praise that I have for my head of department. Um, I'm so lucky. We're a really small department. It's only two of us. Um, and my head of department is just, she's just really amazing, actually. It, it's, it's a really sort of collegiate uh, atmosphere. Um, we do all of our planning collaboratively, all of it. Um, we share all our resources, you know, so as a result, our workload is, is hugely decreased. Um, and we share ideas, we talk to each other, we're very honest about each other. And we were, you know, our practice is improving by observing each other, you know, so I am really lucky that I have this amazing head of department. And I'm very grateful for her allowing me to, to sort of come and um, share with you what we do but also then sort of put our department out for scrutiny and uh, and, and comments so so thank you I'm, I'm very grateful to have such a great um, head of department so when i speak about all of this actually we're a team we're a team we do this together so educational philosophy my educational philosophy you know i've been lucky enough in the three years of being a teacher that that i've had lots of uh, opportunities to visit other schools um, and see other departments you know blazing the trail really doing things differently um, and lots of wider reading as well I'm, I'm a really keen sort of CPD reader um, so my philosophy is based on the fact that art is an academically rigorous subject and should be delivered as such um, and we have really really high expectations and we are really rigorous with the um, with the subjects and the content that we deliver um, and I'll talk about that in a little while but you know all of our subjects and all of our schemes and our curriculum that goes across, we we really focus on these core principles. And, you know, we really don't shy away from those really challenging principles in art. So, to, you know, in year seven, we will teach line, tone, form, uh, mark making, perspective, uh, colour theory. You know, we don't shy away from those things. We don't sort of save those until you're in GCSE. Actually, you're on an apprenticeship in year seven um, to becoming an artist essentially. And these are the things that we believe you need to have and you need to really, really deeply understand these core principles. Um, so I know that some of these these principles can be seen as the boring stuff, you know, this boring, dull, observational drawing, tone, you know, all of these kinds of things. But actually, we believe in our department that to achieve mastery of the, you know you have to understand the essentials and the foundations and the really important stuff that you need to do you have to do more of it you have to do it really really frequently to to get it to be to the highest of standards um, and we again have a really big focus on the fact that drawing it's the foundation of all successful artistic endeavors isn't it really if you can't draw you're unlikely to be able to sort of sculpt or print make or or paint um, and it really is that understanding of form um, and it's the simplest expression of that so we have a heavy focus on drawing and we teach that as I'm going to talk about in a little while about how we teach that but we teach that through direct instruction um, and we take any guesswork out of it there is no guesswork um, so as a result of um, really heavily focusing on these core principles we feel that we have these really great benefits that come from them. So whereas you might think, 
oh god curriculum that's really focused on sort of observational drawing line and tone and you know form and on all these very sort of heavy principles that are within the within the art art world actually what we find is we feel like the student the students get this feeling of success um, and as we know success breeds motivation and it goes on this sort of spiral um, and because the students we've taken the guesswork out often students feel very successful feel like they've done a really good job because we've guided them really closely through the process um, and what we find then is that they actually really enjoy drawing um, we get we've had the highest uptake this year um, in our GCSE options, which bearing in mind EBAC is a big focus. Actually, we've got you know we're, we're now in a small school. We've we've got three year eleven classes, which is the first time since I've been there, um, and the the subject has raised its profile within the academy. So it's you know art now is really seen as a rigorous subject. It's not it's not a DOS subject that you take. Um, Certainly, that's what it was seen when I was at school. It's not a dust subject. It's really rigorous and it's really challenging. Um, and each year, our results are improving and getting better and better and better. And we're really proud of our art results within our academy. Um, something that we're working on and we've started to um, make connections, but we want to build upon this is we're making connections now across the curriculum. So we're starting to look at connecting ideas in religion, and history, uh, English literature and geography and making those sort of natural connections. So as our curriculum moves through, we are trying really hard and certainly next year we hope to build on this success. We're trying really hard to know what they're studying in, in English at that point. What are they studying in the humanities at that point? What connections can we make? How can we plan our curriculum? to take the knowledge that they've gained at that point from English and from history. And let's tie it all together and really, really make sure that that student has this cultural, you know, this, this cultural capital experience um, that, that helps them to understand that actually art is a is a cultural pillar. It is a cultural pillar. And if and if we really believe in equity and ensuring that, you know, the very disadvantaged cohort that we teach at the academy um, have that wider exposure and that they understand how art fits in with literature and history and religion. Um, so we're working really hard on that. And I think we've begun to, to make some steps in the right direction with that. But I think we have more to, to do and we have plans in the future to sort of build on that one. So my final point about this is that we also teach um, through historical and biographical contents. So we like to link So the links that we make across the curriculum um, are often uh, are often expressed through story, um, and we know from research that the brain favours story. So we use um, historical stories, religious uh, religious connections to artists, um, and also sort of um, fiction and plays, and and we weave a, a hinterland of, of of knowledge around. The, the subject that we are teaching within art um, and we find that often really captivates the students but equally it draws in those other threads of knowledge that the students might have perhaps from English literature or uh, from history and from RE and, and it weaves that that knowledge together um, you often see students as you're as you're delivering you know this this uh, anecdote of sort of historical relevance you can see them go oh my god Oh my God, I, I knew that because we talked about that in, um, and it's those connections. And that's when we feel that that's really, really powerful and really strong. Um, so now I'd like to talk to you about how our teaching philosophy in art um, sort of comes into play and, and what it looks like in reality. Um, so I'm gonna describe to you a typical lesson, typical sort of year nine lesson, and I'm gonna describe to you step by step how I deliver direct instruction um, and what that looks like in practice. So I greet all of my students at the door, uh, usually with an enormous smile on my face because I'm so pleased to see them. Um, and they have an arrival activity. They're welcomed into the classroom one by one in silence they go over the threshold of my door, it's in silence, um, and there's an arrival activity on the board. And that arrival activity requires absolutely no instruction. There, there's no questions to be asked. Um, there's 
equipment they know where to get. There is no reason for them to do anything other than pen to paper at that point. And what I find then is that it's a really purposeful, meaningful start. Again, going back to that, every moment is precious in our lessons. Um, we then, once they've had an opportunity to go through those, um, that will usually consist of sort of recall. In fact, it will always consist of recall and recap of prior knowledge. And it might be from last year, it might be from last term, last week, last lesson. Um, and the links then connect to the lesson ahead. OK, so it's always connecting that prior knowledge, but also using that retrieval practice constantly to make sure that they don't forget, interrupt that forgetting. OK, so the final part of the arrival activity is usually open ended and it's usually some kind of practical uh, step. So it might be drawing warm up. It might be um, sort of loosening up your hand ready for shading. It might be practicing drawing your ellipses. And there is a very deliberate idea behind that. And that is because the students that are a bit quicker and a bit faster at retrieving that knowledge have an open ended activity. And therefore, there is never any there's never any period of time where they've got nothing to do. Um, and it gives the other students that perhaps are a little bit slower retrieving that information get a little bit longer just to, to sort of work on that then we go through um, questioning and I use cold calling and I bounce questions around the classroom I'm usually building and sort of linking making connections um, and the questioning part for, for me is first of all most enjoyable part of my practice um, but also really important really important that students are held to account there's no hiding in the classroom um, any student could be asked at any point certainly it's cold calling and I certainly feel looking around that most students are sort of you know having a thing like I've got the answer ready if she asks me oh my god you know there's there's no relaxing um now something else that is um certainly an artifact of the culture in my classroom and in in our art department is really sky high expectations of uh, vocabulary okay and articulating full sentences um, so the vocabulary expectation is really high I've got year sevens that speak like artists um, and certainly we have, when we have visitors in it's um, a comment that is often made you know wow you know the, the scholarly language that these students are using is, is really impressive but that really is sort of the surface of it you know for me if they're using that kind of vocabulary and they're using it correctly and they understand actually that it, it signals far deeper learning so i'm always really proud of them using the the subject vocabulary um, and we insist upon it and we reward re, we reward for it too um, but it is something that we insist upon so then once we've sort of clarified any misconceptions gone through gone through some questioning and sort of recapped any knowledge we then move on to our direct instruction. Now, in our academy, we have an expectation that if a teacher is talking, the students have their hands resting visibly on the desk and they're not allowed to have their pen in their hands. So there's no sort of fiddling or tapping or anything like that. Now, this is just so fantastic in art because what I will then do is I will model uh, what we're going to be doing that day or, or the activity or the drawing that we're undertaking. So I will always begin with what a good one looks like, so a waggle. Um, and then rather than just showing them, you know, this is what I expect you to do, off you go, work it out. That never happens. That never happens. There is always a step by step instruction of how to recreate it. There is no guesswork. It's, there's no discovery learning. It is absolutely modelled to them with clear instructions. Um, and this for me came from when I watched the Michaela podcast about the way that they teach art in their school. Um, and obviously we've seen the results that, that they have gained across the board, absolutely astronomically high, just, you know, so impressive. So we make absolutely no apologies for sort of magpieing that idea that the direct instruction, there's no guesswork. There's no guesswork of how a student is, is to achieve what they're expected to, to do. Um, so we, we model the process on the visualisers with students with no pens in their hands. They're not trying to do it at the same time. There's no split attention. They are watching what I'm doing. Um, and actually what I'll do then is I'll narrate my thoughts. Um, so I'll sort of, you know, speak aloud about my cognitive choices that I'm making. Um, and sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes when I'm drawing on the visualiser, if I'm drawing from observation, I might, I might get it wrong and I've got to rub it out or I've got to redraft it. And that's so powerful. That's so important that students see that 
even the expert in the room gets it wrong and it's no biggie rub it out you know it's no big deal sometimes i deliberately get it wrong um mainly because i'm if i've got a really high percentage of, of students that i look at and i think oh my god you know when you've got those, those particular students that are sort of so driven about perfectionism and they just want to screw up all their work and nothing's ever good enough um i will deliberately get things wrong sometimes to to model the process of accepting when things don't go to plan um, and, and what you do and, and how you deal with that. And that, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and I found quite a lot of success with that. Um, so, so we go through the process of the, the I do, we do, you do, and then we repeat. And then the students at that point get the opportunity to, to, to go off independently. OK, so I usually chunk the learning. So, OK, right now you do it and they'll do that stage that I've just modelled. And I will circle the room at that point. And I'm usually looking for trends. I'm looking for trends of misconception. OK, um, and I'll give immediate personal feedback to students then. Um, but then what I'll do is I'll choose some student students work and I'll take it back to the front, put it under the visualizer um, and I'll use this to praise it and also to critique it. Um, and really, there's no point in me supporting one student at their desk. OK, remember, they're working silently. You know, one student benefiting from my feedback for me is um, it's, it's not efficient. Actually, what I can do is take their work and I can take it up to the visualizer and I can critique it. And, you know, because I've been around and I've identified that a few students have made this mistake and I correct it under the visualizer. Now, this could sound quite stressful, couldn't it, for students? Like, oh, my God, Miss is going to stick my work up on the board and she's going to tell everybody that I've done it wrong and then she's going to correct it. Well, potentially, yes, that could be a bit scary. However, we worked really, really hard on the climate and the culture and the, you know, just the acceptance of making mistakes in art. Um, as I said, sometimes I get it wrong and I have to rub, rub things out. So we have this really, really um, supportive and warm environment. Everybody gets it wrong. Everybody's held to account, um, you know, and, and your work could be up there at any time. And I'm really, really generous with praise. I'm very specific with praise as well. So it feels genuine. Um, it is genuine. Um, and actually, as a, as a school, we favour immediate feedback and whole class marking. So it's something they're quite used to, actually, within the academy. So I'm going to speak to you really briefly about how we assess in our department briefly. Um, so we produce benchmarking activities, particularly important in year seven, because as we know, the, the SATs results that come in, you know, do not, do not sort of usually connect with whether they're any good at a creative subject. Um, so we usually create our own sort of data um, and we do this three benchmarking activities, uh, usually drawing from observation. And then we use comparative judgment across the whole year group and we put them into rank order. OK, um, so we then feed back to the students students promptly as possible with really specific feedback on what they need to work on. They would then do the exact same activity at the end of that year. Um, and, and there's a direct connection. We often use those pieces of work in parents evenings as well to feedback. Um, and we usually have some kind of conversation with that student where they've got their, their first piece of work and their second piece of work in front of them. And usually there's a visible difference in, in how much knowledge they've gained over the year. And then, therefore, they then put that into practice in their observational drawing. So it's it's really clear to the student. It's a really powerful exercise. Really clear to the student that they can see the progress that they have made. So the thing I'm going to talk to you now. The last section of my talk is going to be talking to you about the areas of, of development that that you know my classroom practice requires. Um, so something that I'm really working on and I have been working on for the last year, but I'm certainly going to continue uh, working on is moving my GCSE students from sort of heavily scaffolded um, support to independence. So I'm always looking for the best way. And often, you know, some students, it just naturally happens. They just progress into this very independent because they feel so confident and so secure in their um, base knowledge and other students, it's a little bit more of a journey. So it's something that I'm working on. So please do feel free to DM me and, and sort of add comments if you've got any particular tips or success that you experience, you know, taking those students that have had heavily scaffolded support from you and then sort of allowing them to fly in their, into their independence. Um, something else that I'm working on 
is uh, or or I you know feel that this is always a journey is getting parents on board making sure that parents um, support uh, the art department and we do this by we, we loan a lot of equipment out and we just trust students that they will bring it back and they usually do they're really good um, and we're really we're really proactive with our communication home as well um, and I think this probably comes from my sort of pastoral uh, pastoral role as well that I'm really keen to um, to get in there quick with my communication so I will do postcards home I will do um, positive emails home regularly and I really get try to get that ratio of four positive communications to one negative and if you've got some positive communication in the bag with the parents you know little Jimmy did such an amazing drawing today and I'm so proud of him and he worked so hard and his concentration was so good thank you so much you know but by email that one time that I then have got to make that call to say he's not done his homework you know again I'm really unhappy um, I find then it can be really really proactive um, so getting parents on board is, is really important and really key to the department. Um, so something else that we've worked really hard on is sort of getting students at Key Stage 4 to be engaged, even when the teacher is not, not looking, so to speak. Um, because, of course, you know, at, at Year 10 and Year 11, they should all be working on independent projects. They should, in, And it's so hard to know where everybody is at at all, all times. So actually what we found is this culture of super high expectations, silence as standard, working really, really hard and maximizing every second in your lesson has actually resulted now in our key stage four doing the right thing even when we're not looking. So if your time is taken up and you're demonstrating a new technique with a couple of students in, you know, at the other end of the room, what I find is now the culture is really paying off. It's really paying off because I look across and, and they're still working really hard, even if I don't directly have eyes on them. So something that I've mentioned before is that we're still working on really connecting up that curriculum. And it's something that we really want to focus on, making sure that we are building in um, those connections with other subjects so that we can enrich the lives and, and build that cultural capital throughout the whole of their education and art to be part of that. Um, and the last thing that we're really focusing on this year is building our knowledge organisers. So our knowledge organisers at the moment are an integral part to our curriculum, to our art curriculum. Um, and at the moment, they feel a little bit like sort of vocabulary or a concept almost like a list of things to learn well my head of department and i are, are completely in awe of ollie cav um, and we would just love to work on producing a sort of graphic organizer um, that works perhaps some, we were thinking about something perhaps like a timeline that involved you know how their sort of social context and key movements and biography and culture how that all comes into play and illustrating that in a sort of ollie cav style uh, knowledge organizer with really student friendly um, really really student friendly language so if anybody has been successful in doing that I would absolutely love to see it please can you DM me on Twitter um, and send me any successes that you've achieved there so that's me coming to the end of my of my talk um, I'm really grateful for you listening to me please join in a conversation I'm really really open to sort of comments and scrutiny scrutiny uh, please be kind that's my first presentation and um, so I'm on Twitter at, at Tamsin Bellaby um, and as I said I'm not an expert this is just what what has worked for me um, and it's taken a lot of time I've made lots and lots of mistakes um, and there's been a you know a sort of period of struggle to achieve where where we're at now which is a, an upward trajectory of, of sort of you know really doing well within our within our subject um, however I am committed to the fact that I know it's going to take more time it's going to take more more mistakes and more struggle um, and that's the joy that's the joy of being a teacher isn't it the task is never done um, so thank you so much again to my lovely head of department who's allowed me to expose our working practice to to lovely people um, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you very much.